We are uh, very happy to have uh, Jinu uh, for the, today's seminar. So Jinu, Jinu Shin uh, is a KAIST uh, uh, endowed chair professor uh, in Kim Jae Chul uh, Graduate School of AI and the School of Electric, uh, Electrical Engineering at KAIST. And he has received a PhD from MIT in 2010 with uh, a George M. Sproul's award, uh, uh, best uh, CS PhD uh, thesis at MIT. And, uh, uh, and he has been a postdoctoral researcher at uh, Algorithms and Randomness Center at Georgia Tech, and then uh, Business Analytics and Mathematical Sciences Department at, uh, at IBM uh, Watson. And then he joined KAIST in 2013, and uh, since then he's been focusing on algorithmic foundations of machine learning. And he has received uh, many uh, awards, uh, Rising Star Award uh, from ACM Sigmetrics in 2015, Kenneth uh, Sefcik Award at uh, ACM Sigmetrics Performance 2009, uh, Best Publication Award from Informs Applied Probability Society in 2023, uh, 2013, uh, Best Paper Award at ACM uh, MOBI HOC uh, 2013, and Bloomberg Scientific Research Award in 2015, uh, and ACM Sigmetrics uh, Test of Time Award 2019. So today, uh, Jinu will uh, discuss contrastive uh, representation learning with Rennie divergence. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Jinu. Uh, thank you, Chang'an, uh, for a kind introduction. And thank you, uh, organizers, for inviting me to speak here. Uh, I'm quite excited to speak uh, here as I've grown up as stochastic networks and applied uh, probably community, but uh, after I came back to Korea and joined KAIST, I did some research of different flavors. But uh, I, today I will present the one of them, but uh, I will I, I hope to deliver all the technical stuff uh, with the uh, least uh, background. So if you have any question, please uh, leave your question at any time during the talk and after the talk. Okay. So today uh, I will present the contrastive representative learning with Lenny divergence. Okay, so okay, so here is the outline of the talk. Uh, actually, there are two parts of my talk. And first part uh, is mostly uh, theoretical stuff. And second part is mostly the empirical stuff. So uh, in the first part, I will establish and introduce uh, several variational methods for estimating probability divergences. And the second part, I will um, explain how this method can be applied to solve uh, real world problems. Okay. Okay. So, uh, okay. So let me start with. I'm sorry. Let me start with some definition of mutual information. So, given a pair of random variable uh, x and y. Okay. Uh, and then uh, here p x comma y is the joint distribution or joint density of this random variable. And I will denote px and py is marginal distribution or marginal densities. Then mutual information uh, i, uh, x, y is uh, defined as uh, this uh, KL divergence uh, between px comma y uh, and px times py. Okay, and this is uh, for a uh, uh, KL divergence is formally uh, defined as like this. Okay. Okay. Uh, then uh, the main question I will address in the part one is how to estimate mutual information uh, given the samples. Okay. It means that the given sample uh, x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3 drawn from underlying unknown uh, uh, distribution in disjoint distribution how to estimate the mutual information, okay? So uh, this is not an easy problem, why? Because uh, uh, you, you cannot access the, uh, this uh, distribution, okay? So this PXY and this marginal distribution PX and PY is unknown and hidden. So uh, we can only access sample and we, can, we, we cannot access uh, the form of uh, distribution. So, because uh, I mean, this KL divergence required to uh, uh, know the uh, form of PX comma Y. So, I mean, uh, we cannot 
uh, apply this uh, divergence uh, formula directly. So uh, it has many applications. Estimating mutual information has many applications. I will show you uh, an example later in part two. And many parametric and non-parametric methods have been proposed. So for example, estimating uh, mutual information using nearest neighbor method. But recent work uh, tend to focus on using variational bound with deep neural networks. That's uh, what I want to introduce next. Okay. Okay. So let me uh, introduce uh, one variational method. Okay. So this is known as uh, NWJ bounds. Well, let me explain. So for a given function phi, okay, a scalar function, and then uh, consider is a, a conjugate function. A phi star. So phi star is defined as like this. And then uh, uh, they consider some generalized uh, divergence. So this is called phi divergence, uh, formally defined as like this. And then they provide some variational formula, formula for uh, this divergence. So actually this phi divergence is actually the generalized version of KL divergence because if you choose phi as log uh, mu log U and corresponding conjugate is the this form, uh, then you can uh, easily see that, uh, I mean, this is nothing but KL divergence, okay? So uh, they provide that uh, this uh, divergence is the supremum over all the functions. So this is function is measurable function, okay? And this is uh, expectation over uh, P and this is expectation over Q. And the second expectation is with, with respect to conjugate. Okay, so this uh, formula, uh, this formula is nice. Why? Because, I mean, if you apply this formula for uh, uh, mutual information and k-weight divergence, uh, this bound uh, provide a variational uh, characterization of uh, mutual information. So if you go back to the definition of mutual information, this, this, this is defined by uh, KL divergence, right? And then, uh, uh, if you apply the uh, this variational bound for KL divergence in mutual information, you can obtain following formula. So mutual information of x, y is supremum over all the measurable function f. And here, uh, I, the if is defined by uh, this form. Okay, so uh, this is easy to check because uh, this phi b is e to the v minus one. So that's the reason why we have this form, right? Uh, and then uh, mutual information is divergence between uh, px, y and px times py. So yeah, that's the reason why we have uh, this term. So it's elementary to check. So now good thing is uh, this expectation, okay? So here, uh, this expectation, okay? This expectation is the estimate using samples from uh, this hidden distribution. What? Actually, you can do some Monte Carlo uh, method and then using the samples, uh, using average, you can estimate this expectation. So it means that using samples, you can compute. Basically, you can compute uh, this quantity and then by uh, ma making um, uh, maximizing this function over this quantity, you can estimate uh, uh, this uh, true mutual information. So that, that more, more formally, uh, you can consider, uh, I mean, neural networks, Okay, neural networks F theta. Here, theta is a parameter of neural networks. And then because a neural networks uh, in theory, a neural network can approximate any function in uh, arbitrary uh, precision from universal approximation theorem. And then you can uh, maximizing the parameter over theta, and you can expect that this provide a good estimator for mutual information. Okay, okay. so uh, so far so good. Okay, so let me, uh, in the next slide, let me ex explain the uh, better bound of, of uh, better method than uh, this NWJ. So this is called the DB bound. This, this uh, bound proposed the following form. So this form is, looks uh, very similar uh, to NWJ bound, right? So difference is that, that there is some log term here, right? But uh, uh, NWJ bound, there is no log term here. But the overall uh, kind of formula looks very similar. Uh, actually, you can prove uh, this bound using uh, previous bound. So here, uh, proof is quite simple. Okay, so uh, actually, 
uh, from uh, NWJ bound, we know this one, right? Here, from here to there, I just replace F by F minus some A. So here, A is uh, some constant, right? So still, I mean, uh, still this is supreme over all the functions. So still, uh, supreme over uh, F minus A is still uh, um, uh, whole bit equality. And then from here to there, you maximizing this quantity over A. Then uh, you can easily check that this maximum or suprema or is achieved by at this point. Okay. Uh, then, uh, yeah, then this is the proof. So then this, this if you plug uh, this one here, you, you obtain uh, this uh, formula. This is called the uh, DB bound. So from this derived derivation, you can uh, easily see that uh, this DB bound is tighter than NWJ bound because uh, this is a supremum over A. So uh, this bound, DB bound is uh, better than NWJ bound, okay? Okay, so good. So let me introduce one more bound, okay? Uh, this is yeah, well, can, I, can I ask a qu quick question? Yeah. Um, I, I wonder, this is really cool. I wonder, could you give some insights on why computationally uh, these bounds are easier to apply than let's a sample complicated wise, let, let's say just raw sampling from the distribution and estimating the, the chaos divergence directly. Is there some intuition as to why uh, using the convex conjugates kind of leads to more efficient uh, estimators? Uh, actually, um, uh, how to compute the, I mean, mutual information without knowing uh, distribution form, right? Uh, that's uh, not easy, right? So what, what types of uh, estimator you're considering instead of uh, this, this, uh, this estimator? I see. So like you cannot even approximate in, in your setting, like the distribution, you cannot even draw samples from it. Is that the, the main limitation? Exactly, exactly. So I don't have any idea for, I mean, P. I only have samples. But, but in your bounds, you also have a, you also have to compute expectation with respect to P and Q, right? Yeah, 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 exactly, 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 right? So, I mean, yeah, but this is the expectation over F, right? So F is right. we know, right? Okay. F is we know, but uh, this is uh, oh, expectation over P and Q. P and Q, we don't know, right? I see. So not only, I see. So so the samples you have like from data, but then at least when you evaluate, F is known, but in the previous equation, you need to know the PDF or PMF or P and Q themselves. Exactly, exactly. I, exactly. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it, that's the point. Yeah, exactly. Got it, thank you. Okay, thank you for clarification. Okay. So uh, let me give you uh, one more bound. Okay, so this is called CPC bound. Okay, so uh, actually let me explain the, the formula. So this is also provide the lower bound of mutual information. So expectation over uh, X comma Y prime, which is actually from joint distribution and Y minus, actually plus is uh, from joint distribution and Y minus is marginal distribution, okay? And then anyway, whatever it is uh, defined by here, okay? So this actually, if uh, X, Y is from joint distribution, we call it positive pair. If X and Y is from uh, uh, some marginal distribution independently, we call it negative pair, okay? Okay, so this is also called uh, information noisy contrastive estimation. And then as like before, if you are maximizing this lower bound, maybe you can use it uh, for estimator of mutual information as like before, okay? Okay, good. Um, now, but uh, this is uh, sad news, but unlike the previous bound, this bound is uh, quite loose uh, of mutual information because uh, uh, up, there's some upper bound, okay? So you can easily see that uh, this formula is uh, at most uh, this one because I ignore the summation. And then this is cancel out. And then you can easily check that this is at most uh, log k plus one. So this is, it means that uh, mutual information is larger than log k plus one. This estimator cannot uh, approximate mutual information. So in practice, uh, many work using this bound uh, suggest to use a large number of k, okay? So the next question is uh, why do we care about CPC? I mean, this is uh, I mean bad bound. Uh, then uh, what is the advantage of CPC? compared to DB and DB and NWJ bound, okay? 
So to provide you some insight, uh, then let me uh, uh, explain some toy example with Gaussian data. So in this experiment, I sampled d-dimensional Gaussian vector x comma y with correlation low. Then this Gaussian uh, word, you can compute the mutual information exactly. Here, the mutual information is following analytic form, okay? And then you can consider another random variable Z. Here, W is a some full length matrix. And then we have some entry wise, uh, um, I mean, I mean cub cubic operation. And then uh, it means that uh, this is what there's one to one mapping between Z and X, right? Uh, y, I'm sorry. Uh, mutual information between X and Y is same as mutual information between X and Z, right? Good. Okay, so then uh, now I draw samples from uh, this distribution, X, Y, L, Y, Z, and then apply NWJ and DV and CPC based estimator for uh, estimating this mutual information. So actually the, in, um, here uh, in this figure, uh, mutual information between X, Y, X and Y denoted by Gaussian and mutual information uh, x and z is denoted by uh, cubic. So actually, this is a true value. Okay. Ideally, these all three uh, quantities should be same, right? Okay. If uh, estimator is perfect. Okay. Now you can. This is the experiment. So and then every uh, every four uh, k training epoch, you increase the load. So that's the reason why uh, true value is uh, has some this step function. Okay. And then we use the same neural network because uh, you you uh, for for the estimator, okay. And then we train this neural network, maximizing the low bound, and then uh, hope to estimate uh, this true bound. So uh, as you Jim, see quick here, question, quick yeah, question. Okay. What what architecture do you use for F? Uh, F is uh, just a simple, uh, I mean, multi layer perceptron. Okay. okay, a fully connected neural network, some standard uh, neural network. No special architecture. Okay, so you see that uh, you can observe that here, NWJ and DV has very uh, high variance when uh, I mean I mean mutual information is high, right? Compared to that, CPC has very low variance, but there are some big bias, right? Uh, so actually, that's the point. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so NWJ DB has uh, maybe a uh, good uh, bias, but very high variance. Uh, in particular, when mutual information is high. Actually, and, and then also it is uh, theoretically known that the uh, variance of uh, NWJ and DB based estimator has the uh, following uh, low bound of uh, uh, with respect to mutual information. So this means that the uh, number of samples uh, it should be exponentially large with respect to mutual information so that uh, to make a variance constant. Okay, it means that uh, it is uh, typically unable to estimate uh, a high mutual information. So on the other end, uh, CPC has very low variance and empirically, and, uh, but but problem is that uh, uh, it has high bias, right? Uh, so uh, to resolve uh, this issue of CPC, uh, there are several variants of CPC uh, having lower bias. Okay, so this is one of the most popular variant, which is called alpha CPC. So look at this formula. So this formula is very close to the previous formula. Previous formula. This is formula of CPC, and this is a formula for alpha CPC. Okay, so there is some alpha term is here. Then you can check that the alpha is uh, chosen by one over k plus one. This is exactly becomes original CPC. So this is kind of generalization of uh, CPC. And then, uh, I mean, the, it is known that if you choose alpha is uh, larger than this quantity, one over k plus one, this alpha CPC has lower bias. Okay. So in the sense, the alpha CPC by controlling alpha, maybe uh, this is better uh, than CPC. Okay. Uh, so of course, uh, there are. Uh, even more uh, better uh, bounds uh, motivated by alpha CPC. So this is called the uh, alpha ML CPC. Okay, so this is kind of uh, some, some batch version of alpha CPC. But in this talk, I will focus on alpha CPC 
Uh, but uh, it's good to know there is uh, some uh, more advanced one. So uh, this alpha MSTPC is known to be more tight, even tighter than alpha CPC. Okay, and also have uh, some lower uh, bias. Okay, so in the next slide, I will focus on alpha CPC and explain why alpha CPC has lower bias uh, and probably better than the CPC. Okay, okay. So this is uh, again some such toy experiment. Okay. Uh, so when uh, alpha is exactly one over k plus one, this is exactly original CPC, okay? But you, you see that if, uh, if you choose a smaller alpha, uh, you can see that uh, this toy experiment, you can see the lower bias. But if you choose uh, zero alpha, you, you see that the uh, very high variance, right? Actually, there are some trade-off. If you choose large alpha, you see the low variance, but high bias, okay? But it means that the main message here is alpha control uh, bias the various trade-off in this uh, variation estimate. Okay, good. So in the next slide, I will give you some insight why this is happening in a uh, theoretical uh, manner, okay? So to, to this end, uh, let me introduce the concept of skewed divergence. So skewed divergence is nothing but uh, uh, alpha Q KL divergence uh, between two uh, distribution P and Q is defined by here. So alpha is zero. This is uh, nothing but original KL divergence, right? Okay, so this is uh, defined by uh, some KL divergence. You can apply the known some existing variational DB bound for uh, this one. And then you can also obtain following uh, variational characterization. Okay, okay, good. So uh, now using this concept, so using this concept, you can prove that actually this alpha CPC low bound the mutual information. So this is very elementary characters. So let me go one by one. So uh, this is the original formula for uh, CPC. So whatever it is, okay, from here to there, I just, uh, this one becomes there and this uh, denominator becomes here, okay, okay. So uh, from here to there, I just uh, this log and uh, exponential is canceled and I just go here. And here I put expectation is inside. So this is the reason I put approximation. Okay. Then now what is this? This is exactly the uh, variational bound for, uh, for alpha skewed version of KLWs in the previous slide. So if you look at previous slide, this is exactly that form, right? So this is uh, exactly uh, from DB bound uh, for any function f. This is the lower bound of uh, secure uh, KL divergence. And the secure KL divergence is lower bound of uh, original divergence and original divergence is related to mutual information. Okay, good. So uh, this, uh, uh, actually there are two important messages here in, uh, 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 in this uh, derivation. So this argument implies that uh, Actually, alpha CPC is nothing but some estimator of skewed, uh, alpha skewed uh, KL divergence instead of original KL divergence, right? So that's the first message. And the second message is that uh, this uh, derivation also explains why uh, alpha control bias variance trade-off. Because suppose alpha is close to zero, alpha is very small, right? Then uh, this inequality holds the equality, right? Then it means that uh, original this goes to original divergence, and hence you can expect the low bias. But if you alpha is goes to small and uh, this becomes large, if you be, it becomes large, you can uh, expect a large variance because of the B bound. Okay. In on, on the other end, if alpha becomes large, alpha becomes large, then uh, this 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 one also becomes almost close to zero. Okay. It means very high bias, okay? But uh, we can, you can expect low variance because uh, uh, this, uh, this becomes a smaller, okay? So, right. So uh, that's the take uh, message. And more theory, even theoretically, uh, we prove that uh, if F star, uh, actually F star is, uh, suppose F star is uh, kind of achieved this premium, oh, then uh, under this uh, F star, uh, the, uh, the variance of uh, estimator of this Q alpha uh, KN divergence is uh, upper bound by this term. 
Okay, here n is number of sample in use in estimation, and alpha is uh, some alpha, right? So here, if you choose alpha is uh, this this quantity, uh, you can uh, uh, show that variance is constant. And then uh, this theorem also proved that if you choose a large alpha, uh, then you can reduce uh, variance. Okay. Now, similarly, you can prove a similar theorem for alpha version of uh, NWJ. So now the remain, remember the what is the title of this talk? We uh, are uh, contrastive learning. So, so now next uh, I, I'm, I'm going to explain this idea of skewed divergence estimation is applicable to other types of uh, divergence. Okay. So now let me introduce uh, another types of divergence, Lenny divergence. Okay. So Lenny divergence is uh, another generalization of KL divergence. Uh, it has the following some form. So you can check that there is some additional parameter gamma here. So uh, if gamma is close to one, it becomes a uh, KL divergence. Okay, so in that sense, uh, this is a uh, uh, generalization of KL divergence. Also, uh, it generalizes many other divergence. If uh, gamma is a 0 0.5, uh, this is becomes a Hellinger divergence. If uh, gamma is two, it, it becomes actually essentially chi-sphere divergence, okay? Okay, so uh, now um, using this uh, I mean, Lenny divergence, instead of KL divergence, you can consider Lenny version of mutual information because the uh, original mutual information is uh, uh, KL divergence between Px, y and Px times Py. Then now you can consider uh, Lenny divergence and then instead of KL, and then you can consider Lenny version of mutual, mutual information. Okay, now I will ask the same question. Can you estimate this uh, uh, Lenny version of mutual information? Okay, as like uh, original mutual information. Okay, so uh, uh, luckily it is well known that uh, it is also known that some variational bound for this uh, Lenny uh, mutual information. So uh, uh, here, uh, if uh, gamma, uh, gamma is a parameter for uh, Lenny divergence, if gamma is close to one, it, it also becomes a previous uh, DB bound for uh, KL divergence. So, so far so good. But uh, here the, there is some issue. Okay, so uh, as you expect, if you, lost, if you design some estimator naively based on this variational bound, uh, it means that you 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 approximate uh, this expectation based on samples, and you maximize f using neural networks. Then uh, this estimator for this uh, Lenny mutual information also uh, have high variance. Okay. Now I want to fix this issue uh, as like before. Okay. So more theoretically, we in in, in our paper we prove that indeed uh, this estimator have a uh, large variance, uh, we, we prove lower bound. And here, uh, gamma is uh, typically between zero, uh, one and two. So here, uh, numerator maybe uh, 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 dominate uh, 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 denominator. Okay, so this is exponentially also growing as uh, mutual information is growing, okay? okay. So um, now my goal is to design low variance estimator, this uh, Lenny version of mutual information. Okay. Now we want to utilize a uh, previous uh, lesson. So how uh, alpha CPC can reduce the variance of estimation of uh, KL divergence. Okay. So answer is uh, simple. It's uh, actually we know that it, it approximate the it's Q version of KL divergence instead of the original one. So that's the key, right? That's the key in the previous derivation, right? So alpha CPC approximate the skewed version of KL divergence. So that's the reason why it can reduce the variance. So you can apply the same idea here in Lenny version. So now you can, you, I, we consider skewed version of Lenny divergence, which is uh, 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 something like that. I introduced alpha here. Then you can also uh, uh, define skewed version of mutual information, right? Uh, uh, based on this uh, skewed version of a divergence, right? Then uh, you can apply existing variational bound, okay? Uh, then you can, variational bound means that uh, this one, and then you can also uh, obtain the following uh, form. And then as like before, this expectation can be estimated using samples, and then you can maximizing F uh, 
uh, using neural networks, you can approximate uh, this Rennie version of uh, uh, mutual information, okay? So indeed, okay, as like before in toy example, we found that as expected, uh, as like before, okay? Alpha can control bias and various trade-offs, okay? Okay, so actually that, that's, uh, okay. Also in our paper, we proved that actually uh, this, uh, this estimator have uh, some uh, low variance. Okay, it's like before. So that's not that hard. Okay, let me give you some take home message in the part one. Okay, so we propose a low variance variation estimator for Lenny divergence. Okay, uh, so how it is possible? Uh, so this was possible. We discovered that the existing CPC and MSCPC are variation estimator for skew version of K divergence. This is our uh, finding. Uh, although CPC and MLCPC exist in the literature, but this is our kind of reinterpretation of uh, this existing uh, method. And through this analysis, also we, uh, we theoretically explain that how CPC and uh, this MLCPC become lower variance and high bias estimators for mutual information. So using this technique, we apply this Q divergence technique uh, to Lenny divergence, and then, yeah, we uh, finally achieve low variance, low variance variation estimator for uh, Lenny diverge. Okay, okay. So next, uh, I'm gonna give you some application of uh, our estimator for Lenny divergence. Okay, so that becomes uh, contrastive learning. Okay, okay. So uh, let me give you some motivation for the part two. So as you may know, uh, deep neural network have uh, achieved remarkable success in various domains, which is, uh, I think, a major founding in artificial intelligence during 2011 to 2015. So, but uh, at this age, at this period, uh, I mean, people expect that training neural networks requires a massive amount of manually labeled data. For example, uh, this figure, uh, illustrate the models that won ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenge. So this is ImageNet challenge. Uh, it's a kind of Olympics for uh, computer vision test. So uh, given 1 million training label data set, uh, each team in the competition uh, 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 is uh, solving the ImageNet classification test with building a machine learning model to classify an input image as one of uh, 1,000 categories. Right. So here, uh, uh, 20, uh, 2012 is the first year when uh, deep neural networks uh, win the competition. Okay. After that, uh, all the team, all the winner uh, use the deep neural networks. You see that uh, even uh, the performance of neural networks uh, surface uh, human performance. Okay. At least uh, in this uh, task. Okay. So, uh, okay, um, and then next, what is the major founding in artificial intelligence in 2016 to 2020, okay? So, uh, okay, uh, arguably, I think uh, we found that large model performs better, okay? This is uh, some figure uh, from OpenAI blog. So, uh, and then people say that, okay, in deep learning uh, area, model becomes twice larger uh, for each three and four months. It means that every year, a uh, model becomes 10 times larger, roughly speaking, okay? So this is another article uh, from uh, uh, explaining the uh, uh, GPT-3. So GPT-3 is a machine learning model uh, for natural language processing. It has uh, 175 billion parameter, and then uh, it has memory exceeding 350 gigabytes and cost uh, uh, 12 million uh, to train at once, okay? So this is huge model, but that, of course, uh, this model is, uh, uh, okay, I mean, uh, published in two years ago. Uh, nowadays, uh, we, we, we can find the even larger model than GPT-3, okay? Okay, so point is following. So to train such large scale model, uh, we need the large scale training data. However, uh, constructing large-scale label data is not easy, too expensive, and uh, even impossible, okay? Because, uh, uh, I mean, labeling uh, data is uh, time-consuming. For example, uh, you have to annotate all the bounding boxes, for example, such kind of image for object detection. 
And then sometimes uh, labeling data requires some human expert knowledge, for, for example, in the medical domain and some retrosynthesis. Okay. So, main question uh, is the following. So, uh, maybe uh, collecting unlabeled data without any human annotation is extremely easy. Okay. So, then question is the how to utilize this unlabeled data for training uh, neural networks. Okay. Actually, that's the main question in the part two. Okay, for to this end, uh, self-supervised learning is common. So what is the idea of uh, self-supervised learning is uh, uh, instead of uh, constructing label with human, uh, construct the label only from signal without any human annotation, okay? And then uh, label is a construct without any human annotation, only from signal, you can just apply supervised learning approach. This is some example. So uh, this is some image. And then given in this image, you consider nine patches, okay? And then given center position, okay? And then you can uh, ask the model to predict the one of uh, this location of second patches. So there are, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. nine there's nine possible ways. Uh, this, it means that uh, you ask the model to, uh, to perform eight uh, way classification. Okay. So uh, this is one example. So this label is, uh, can be constructed automatically, right? We, we don't need any human annotation for uh, performing this task, right? Okay. And training the neural network, corresponding neural network. Okay. So uh, this is a second example. Okay, so uh, it is a rotating given image. So given image, you can rotate the image to uh, a 90 degree and 180 degree and 270 degree, right? And then we have uh, four classes, okay? Then given input image, you can ask a model to predict the rotated degree, okay? And it means that you can ask the model to perform four-way classification, okay? So this is an example of self-supervised learning, okay? So this uh, training, this neural network using this self-supervised uh, task uh, do not uh, need the, any human annotated label, okay? Okay, so uh, what you can expect from uh, learning from self-supervised learning. So to predict uh, so this self-supervision, uh, we expect uh, maybe the model might learn uh, uh, high level understandings of input and a uh, high level representation of data might be learned without any human annotation through self supervised learning. So, uh, how to evaluate the quality of self supervised learning? So, uh, first, uh, you can train uh, so you can train large scale unlabeled data using self supervised learning, and then uh, pre train these pre trained neural networks. Uh, uh, you, you can test this network for various downstream tests with limited data. It means that you freeze the representation along by self supervised learning, training only the last uh, linear classify, classification layer using only few samples. So, for example, you can pre train self supervised learning using ImageNet data set, 1 million data set. You can apply this representation to, you, to some. Uh, another uh, task using fewer samples. Okay, so the uh, people expect that without this pre-training, uh, uh, this this uh, classification problem is uh, not easy to solve. But after but uh, after pre-training, I mean, people expect that you can solve uh, this uh, classification problem with uh, fewer samples. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is a typical procedure for evaluating the quality of self-supervised learning. Okay. Okay, so I mean, uh, this steps for learning is crucial for training large scale uh, foundation model, which is uh, argu arguably, I think, uh, main trend of current uh, machine learning research. So it is because uh, it, has been, it has been well evidenced that uh, uh, adapting a foundation, big foundation model, typically pre-trained pre by uh, self supervised learning is sufficient for solving many real world problems with limited data, okay? So, okay, this is some motivation on um, background. So now let me explain what is the connection between mutual information and self-supervised learning, okay? So uh, this is a well-known InfoMax principle. So InfoMax principle is uh, suggest uh, some uh, beautiful connection between mutual information and uh, good representation of data. 
Okay, so uh, this informed principle suggests that uh, maximizing mutual information between representation of uh, semantically similar data, X, Y. So here, if X, Y is semantically similar, we call it positive pair. So here is some example. So here, X and Y is actually comes from same image, right? Uh, under data augmentation. And then you can expect that the uh, representation of G, X and representation of G, G, Y. So this is a representation of X and Y. It should be similar. It means that the uh, mutual information of uh, this one, it should be similar. So for good representation, okay? So um, yeah, so it means that uh, how to learn a good representation, you just maximizing this uh, mutual information. And uh, I mean, this max info, info principle suggests that, okay, by doing that, you can obtain a good uh, uh, representation, okay? Okay, so, but here the challenge is that how to construct such positive pair without any human annotated label, right? So typically uh, people in practice use uh, data augmentation. So here uh, data augmentation means that uh, in the image domain, uh, this is the original image, you can crop some, some, some sub, sub part, part of uh, original image and you can resize and you can also do some rotated and you can also consider some noisy version. So there are various types of augmentation, okay? So uh, basically you use uh, this augmented image as positive pair and then maximizing G uh, under this uh, uh, formula. And then G uh, in this maximizing solution, G uh, expected to be a good representation of uh, uh, data. So that's uh, this principle, okay? But as you expect, that here to perform max, max, uh, info max principle, you need to approximate mutual information. So that's the reason why we need the uh, variational bound for mutual information. So in the part one, we know that uh, we have a variational bound for this mutual information. So uh, mutual information is uh, actually uh, can be approximated by maximum over F, and this is a CPC bound. And this is the formula of CPC bound. Okay. Okay. So uh, here, uh, x in in the context of uh, I mean representation learning, x uh, y uh, from joint distribution is positive pair, which is actually augmented data uh, from same source. Okay. We, and then we call it positive pair. This is a positive pair. Okay. And uh, if x and y are from different data. Okay, suppose this, is, this x and this y is uh, from different data, then we call it negative pair. Okay, uh, so yeah, that, that is uh, CPC uh, 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 does. Okay. okay, so then here f is uh, called uh, uh, similarity critic, and this is, uh, I mean, uh, kind of uh, uh, formulated by some neural networks. Uh, for example, I mean, this work. Uh, Chen et al. Uh, consider some cosine uh, critic, which is actually uh, in a product of uh, uh, X, HX and HY. Here, H is nothing but some, some multi-layer perception, neural networks, okay? okay? Actually, this is uh, some design choice, okay? Okay, so this is what people do uh, in the literature, and uh, but there are some issues in this uh, contrastive learning. So one issue is uh, data augmentation. So data augmentation is not always perfect, okay? For, uh, this is some example that if you, uh, uh, this is original image, if you crop, uh, if you crop this portion and this portion, okay, although these two images are from same source, you can expect that these two images does not share the uh, same information, right? And also, okay, this is another example, you crop this portion and you crop this portion, right? And this is cat image and this is dog image. This is also from same uh, source, but does not share uh, common information. So it means the representation of uh, these two images should be different. So uh, that's one issue, okay? Uh, so uh, second issue is that uh, contrastive learning typically requires a huge computation resource. So, I mean, at least uh, three or 10 times more training effort need to converge compared to supervised learning. For, for example, uh, most existing contrastive learning scheme requires at least two weeks 
in training uh, converge uh, under re even recent uh, HGPU machine, which is uh, possible under our lab scale experiments and under image and data set. Okay, so that's the two issue. And uh, I will explain how we can overcome this issue using uh, Lenny divergence. Okay, okay. So uh, now um, our idea is that so, so instead of uh, original mutual information, uh, we suggest to uh, optimizing uh, Lenny version of mutual information and corresponding variational bound of Lenny divergence. Okay, okay. So then uh, your question is that why this uh, Lenny uh, uh, version of mutual information is better than a KL based uh, method in terms of uh, learning representation, okay? So our first intuition is that uh, uh, you can easily see that Lenny divergence penalize uh, two distribution if uh, they uh, uh, penalize more when two distribution is misaligned more, right? So this is a kind of a simple uh, toy experiment with, with uh, two central Gaussian distribution. As uh, two distribution becomes uh, uh, misaligned, then this quantity is become larger. So here, gamma is a parameter of uh, Lenny divergence. And this is original uh, blue line is original KL, right? You see the scale, right? So, so in the extreme case, if you kind of uh, gamma goes to uh, infinity, it only cares about some maximum point between uh, this, this ratio, okay? So, so, I mean, our intuition is that, uh, okay, our goal is to maximizing Lenny divergence. It means that our goal is to maximizing Lenny divergence. If you're maximizing Lenny divergence, uh, our objective becomes uh, larger and larger compared to KL divergence, then it, it means that it, 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 it becomes, uh, I mean, corresponding gradient becomes also larger compared to KL. So, uh, so heuristically, we expect that this may accelerate the training speed because uh, gradient uh, uh, of neural network become larger. Uh, and then, uh, okay. And then next, uh, I will explain uh, Lenny divergence is also useful for handling noisy view. Okay, so. Uh, this can be also easily seen as uh, our gradient uh, analysis of uh, Lenny uh, uh, contrastive learning. So this is uh, our uh, variational uh, approximator for uh, Lenny uh, mutual information. And then if you compute the derivative with respect to parameter of neural networks, you can easily see such formula, okay? So this, this one is uh, comes from the positive pair. Uh, which is augmented from the same same source, and this one is uh, from negative pair, which is augmented from uh, different sources. So it means that the positive pair, I mean, any type of training, you 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 want you want to uh, increase this f in negative pair, you want to decrease uh, this f, okay, under this uh, updating rule, okay. Okay, so now you can uh, observe that if you choose the uh, gamma is uh, larger than one, we have. Uh, Two uh, uh, effects. So, uh, first one is hard negative sampling. So, hard negative sampling means that the, uh, this part, okay, this part, uh, gradient weight more on uh, some uh, samples uh, which have high value of F. So, it means that uh, this is hard, we, we call it this is hard negative, okay. Uh, this property was also exist in uh, KL-based methods as a CPC and MLCPC, but uh, Lenny controlled the level of uh, this hard negative sampling using this additional parameter. Uh, that's kind of one advantage of Lenny. Uh, second advantage is more important. The second advantage is the easy positive sampling. Easy positive sampling is that they have uh, this term if uh, gamma is larger than one. So it means that gradient weight more on also high value of theta. It means that the more easy positive sample, okay? So this property uh, does not exist the uh, original KL-based method. And this is indeed, uh, this property is useful for noisy uh, view because uh, uh, noisy view is typically hard positive and uh, this objective uh, focus on easy positive. And it means that uh, uh, clean view, okay? so. Uh, by doing that, we expect that Lenny divergence allow to handle the more harder augmentation uh, and noisy view. Okay, so this is a second uh, property of, uh, I mean, Lenny constructive learning. 
Okay, I'm almost done. Okay, remaining part is uh, some experiment part. So, uh, so in we first, uh, uh, I mean, learn our uh, uh, contrastive learning, learning contrastive learning uh, under ImageNet data set. Okay, you see here, our algorithm is uh, achieve uh, better performance, accuracy. This is evaluate in uh, ImageNet data set and pre-train ImageNet data set and evaluate in ImageNet data set. And they're only using this apple. Okay, so it means that uh, with respect to curve, uh, our uh, algorithm achieves 70, almost uh, 76, uh, which is uh, three or four times faster than uh, existing method. Okay, so uh, that's good. So uh, our algorithm is faster and achieve even better performance as uh, state word performance in image that data set. Second, uh, you can apply this uh, image net pre-trained uh, networks for various downstream tests. Okay, so here, uh, this data, it, image data, and which is uh, uh, never trained by pre uh, self supervised learning, and then you just uh, 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 just measure performance on this data, but using pre-trained network using image net. Okay. So all the this this transport learning scenario, uh, you see that uh, I mean I mean our algorithm is uh, outperform all others. Okay. So also uh, we perform additional experiment not using not only image this experiment using. Uh, 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 oh okay. So this experiment is a kind of okay. So our algorithm is uh, uh, good for hard augmentation. Uh, actually, in the literature, there are also other types of algorithm also handling uh, noisy view and hard augmentation. So we just compare our algorithm with uh, such method and this uh, uh, future classification and uh, object uh, detection task. Uh, we show that uh, yeah, our one is better. Okay, so and then we also apply our algorithm in the graph uh, data and tableau data as well. Okay, you see here, uh, not only for image, uh, you can, uh, we validate that uh, our algorithm is effective on also in tabular, okay? Uh, several evaluation studies. Okay, so uh, now um, uh, let me give you one more uh, minor variation of uh, our method. So, so far I consider self-supervised learning but actually you can apply our uh, uh, contrastive learning even for supervised learning. So supervised setup, uh, we have label, okay? So only difference uh, from self-supervised learning setup is that uh, in self-supervised learning setup, we, have, we don't have label and positive and negative samples is construct from uh, some uh, uh, data augmentation. So this is a self-supervised setup. We, uh, only consider uh, uh, positive and negative data from data augmentation. But it, since we have uh, class information in supervised setup, you can consider positive and negative pairs using class information. So it means that uh, positive pair, uh, because we know that this is dog and this is dog, uh, you, you, you this become positive pair uh, and uh, this is not a dog, right? And this becomes negative pair. But uh, in the previous uh, self supervised setup, uh, this, this dog can be even uh, uh, negative, uh, negative uh, samples. Okay, so that's the kind of minor difference. Uh, but uh, you, can, you can basically, you can apply the same algorithm under this minor difference using labels. And then, uh, yeah, and then it is stay st straightforward to learn this, our algorithm, LANICL, to even for supervised setup. So, and why? Uh, learning this algorithm supervised survey is meaningful. So we expect that uh, our algorithm pro provide a more transport transferable representation to various downstream tests because uh, in the previous slide, I proved that uh, Lenny uh, contrastive learning do following two stuff. So easy positive sampling and hard negative sampling. So in the supervised setup, this provide uh, first that uh, this prevent uh, collapse, collapsing issues. So it means that if you, uh, training supervised uh, training networks, supervised setup. So all the features of same class tend to be collapsed to the uh, single point. So this is not good uh, for transport learning scenarios. So if you want to rep use uh, that representation for other downstream tasks, uh, this uh, phenomenon is, uh, 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 yeah, so a bad, bad stuff. 
it's bad, bad scenario. So second thing is that uh, hard negative sampling uh, also provide uh, class separation. It means that uh, it, it, it uh, uh, Lenny supervised contrastive learning uh, increase the margin of uh, samples of, uh, I mean, two uh, different classes. Okay, so uh, this also help uh, for transport learning uh, performance of uh, this, this uh, uh, algorithm. And then we, we indeed uh, evaluate, indeed evaluate uh, uh, the supervised uh, uh, Lenny divergence. So, so uh, we compare even self-supervised setup and supervised setup. Okay, so this is our previous version without any label. And this is uh, our new version with using with you, you label, right? So now you see that uh, transport learning performance, okay, is a bit improved uh, using uh, this label. And we also not only do uh, these types of uh, data set, we also consider some few shot classification uh, task. And then even in this scenario, okay, so our uh, uh, contrastive learning utilizing label information uh, performs, uh, I mean, all existing other uh, stops, okay? Okay, that's it. Okay, so um, let me summarize uh, our contribution part two. So we propose uh, Lenny contractive representation learning, uh, which achieve uh, state-of-art performance uh, with uh, at least uh, three or five, five times uh, lower uh, training uh, cost, okay? And we proved that the Lenny contractive learning can handle noisy view uh, when using hard augmentation for constructing positive and negative pair. And uh, the reason is that it, con uh, it can uh, conduct the uh, innate uh, easy positive and hard negative mining. So also we validate uh, our algorithm is effective uh, not only for image, but also graph and uh, tabular data set. And then finally, we established that uh, our idea is not only effective in self-supervised setup, also effective in supervised setup for transport learning performance, okay? So, um, that's all. Actually, our paper is a uh, draft in archive, also presented in Eurix in last week. And uh, this is most of part is done by uh, my first year master student, Gyeongmin. Uh, he's maybe, <laughs> just for your interest, he's looking for some uh, inter internship position. He's an extremely, uh, exceptionally good student. I have her seen so far. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, so if you, uh, I worry that I may, uh, I may be too fast for some part, but uh, if you have any question, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, leave. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jinu. So uh, yeah, please feel free to ask question if, you, if uh, anyone has. <clears throat> Um, I, I have a bunch of questions, but <laughs> it's a little higher level, so maybe I will wait at first and if there's any other more specific questions about the talk. Okay, I guess not. So can, can I ask? Uh, first of all, Jim, a really cool talk. Um, indeed, it's quite different from most of the um, talks that research we've seen in this community. I, I guess my question for you is probably speaks to uh, some of us uh, in this community, um, since you sort of did a lot of research in early years on, you know, like the the CMCMA protocols and stochastic dynamics, can you tell us a bit more your view these days on, you know, the interplay between the sort of mo more model driven um, side of applied probability and, you know, machine learning and AI? I guess more specifically, a couple of things. One is just, yeah, how do you see these two communities interact? Should they interact at all? Or should like it sounds like this style of research, the information theory is sort of shared in some way, but then the modeling and the framing is very, very different. And I guess the second question is more from your experience, like it seems very difficult to um for for um for individuals in this community to have like a big impact in AI, right? Because it's such a huge field and there are tons of papers. How do you relate to that? Did you shift your research style? And yeah, what what was your learning along the way? Okay. Yeah, um, Guang Bing is very hard question. Okay, so um, um, how can I say? Uh, okay, I just uh, 
uh, just uh, uh, convey my experience, only experience. Uh, maybe it is not true uh, in general, but uh, uh, in early stage of my uh, uh, machine learning paper, I try to connect uh, uh, between some what I learned so far in applied probability or some theoretical computer science to the machine learning field. Uh, so that's kind of a period of uh, in uh, between uh, 2013 to 2017, something like that. Okay, so I tried uh, that flavor of research. But um, uh, after 2013, uh, actually, uh, uh, that strategy seems not working for me because uh, almost almost all paper were rejected uh, from uh, maybe URIPS and ICML. And uh, actually, uh, I, I just followed the, the uh, style of uh, some typical machine learning researchers. So, um, so what I'm saying now is that uh, basically, I don't know. So uh, mm. it's hard to question. So I still, uh, looking for some nice way to combine these two words. And uh, actually, there's, there's one of the reasons why I present uh, this paper. So this paper is half of this paper is a theory and half of this paper in uh, practice. So of course, I know that uh, this is this yeah. theory is not the exactly flavor of uh, applied probability or stochastic networks. But uh, yeah, but still, I'm hoping uh, uh, such types of research. So uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I actually yeah, do not know. <laughs> well, so can you elaborate a little bit more? Like if you have to isolate this so-called style of, you know, their way of doing research, like what, what's the biggest difference? Like you said, you switched from trying to combine a plot probability with AI, but then you kind of went to just do what that style, but what, what does that, what does that sound to you? Okay, so um, the simple answer is that, uh, okay, you know that, that this field, I mean, this uh, uh, machine learning, deep learning field is quite new, right? We just uh, started, right? So, uh, so speed of uh, experimental uh, research is uh, actually, I think, uh, faster than the other types of uh, more theoretical based uh, research, I think. So that's the reason why uh, main trend of uh, this uh, machine learning research these days are uh, driven by empirical founding rather than uh, more solid uh, theoretical uh, stuff. But, but however, uh, after maybe this field is matured, maybe, maybe 10 years later, maybe I think uh, most of empirical founding uh, maybe is gone because we, all, <laughs> we try almost uh, everything and then uh, theoretical kind of finding, I think uh, maybe uh, more important after uh, 10 years, uh, after once uh, this field is more mature. So um, uh, yeah, that's at least I can say. And uh, yeah, so although I'm, I'm grown up and I'm, you know, I'm a math uh, uh, oriented person uh, when I was uh, graduate school. So, uh, but, Nowadays, uh, I kind of, uh, I mean, pursuing uh, some goal without uh, uh, sticking in math or non-math style. So uh, whatever I think uh, the goal, is, the problem is important, uh, I try to utilize whatever tool I have. So mm. that including math, math tools or maybe sometimes some empirical tools. So uh, that's my current strategy. So uh, I do not, work hard to utilize some, some math tools. So I just uh, I try to ide identify some important problem and then uh, looking for some, what types of uh, tool uh, exists for the problem. So yeah, that's my uh, 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 strategy these days, but uh, maybe all time, maybe I focus on more tools itself. So, and then how these tools can be applied to real world problem. That's kind of uh, my strategy when what, what I was in, uh, graduate school. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I mean by difference. Yeah. Thank you. So, a lot more empirical element uh, in this field. Uh, they're, they're yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, right. Thank you. That's really helpful. And another reason, okay, maybe uh, if I have time, another reason is uh, I realized that uh, Korean students uh, is really good at implementation and uh, Maybe less good. I mean, it depends on who who uh, perform research, but uh, 
Uh, you can find uh, many good uh, hardworking Korean students, uh, very good at implementation and experimental research, but it's not that uh, easy to find some students of uh, high quality uh, theory. So <laughs> that's another reason why uh, I kind of switch my gear after I came back to Korea. Yeah. It's probably hard everywhere, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, this is really cool. All right, so before we proceed, uh, let me just announce one thing. So this is uh, the last uh, seminar of this uh, season. So uh, and so there will be no seminar uh, for the next few weeks uh, until uh, early January. And the new season will start, uh, no, uh, late January. So new season will start uh, in late January or uh, early February. Uh, all right, so... Uh, I have a question, by the way. So you mentioned that uh, there was uh, alpha uh, CPC and then there's uh, multi-label alpha CPC, which, and, and you, your, um, what you presented today is based on uh, alpha uh, CPC. Yeah. And uh, so do you expect that if you use, or is it, um, uh, would it be possible or easy to, um, use multi-label CPC instead of uh, just uh, regular alpha CPC. Uh, and so somehow replace um, and make make it work better or is or what's, uh, yeah, so that, that's my question. Oh yeah, so actually, actually, uh, although alpha CPC is uh, easier to explain, so that's the reason I focus on alpha CPC in this talk. But if you look at the paper, actually Rennie diverse contrastive learning and Rennie uh, uh, contrastive representation learning is uh, actually uh, based on a multi-label version of uh, CPC. So uh -huh. uh, actually in our implementation, we use uh, this idea of multi-label. So I, because it is known that uh, this multi-label version is better than the single label version. So yeah, that's what we did in this paper, but uh, in the, Presentation, I just uh, focus on alpha CPC just for uh, sake of easy, uh, clean uh, presentation. Yeah. I but see. You got, yeah, you, you got the point. Yeah. Oh, great. Thanks. Uh, anyone, any, anyone else has uh, more questions? All right, uh, if not, uh, thank you again, uh, Jinu. Uh, this was wonderful. Uh, and uh, we will uh, conclude our seminar.